So here we go. My talk will be uh, about, uh, it has a very long title, but it will be about a uh, few aspects uh, of the SIPA initiative and how we as a CRO are, uh, what we are doing to get ready for SIPA. So uh, my name is Tim Danker, and um, as a little bit different from what uh, the program says, I'm not, not quite representing NMI. I'm actually representing NMI TT Pharma Services, which is a subsidiary of the NMI, and uh, we are actually a small CO. So a little bit about the history you probably all are aware of, or you all know quite well, uh, what was before SIPA and how will it change? So in vitro cardiac safety so far was completely focused around HERC. HERC uh, block, block of the HERC ion channel can lead to Torsat de Pont, which is a severe life-threatening condition. And uh, that led to withdrawal of uh, already marketed drugs. So as a consequence, in uh, 2005, the S7B guideline was devised and uh, had HERC mandatory to be screened in drug development. Okay, better now? So as a consequence, APC devices, automated patch clamp devices such as the Q-catch became the typical workhorse for early safety screens to identify HERC liabilities as soon as possible in the drug development chain. There's, there was also in the same year the E14 guideline device which uh, has a mandatory TQT studies on healthy humans in clinical trial phase two uh, as a required study to ensure that no uh, arrhythmic, proarrhythmic liabilities are associated with new medication. As a consequence, there is uh, literature on that. Uh, it's statistically proven. We today have safer drugs with reduced risk of trazodipront. So this is kind of a success story. But there are some problems associated with the current focus on solely on HERC. So it's very simple. Not every HERC blocker leads to torsat de Pont. This is because uh, effects on other ion channels may balance the HERC block. So you have HERC block, but in the end, the heart rhythm stays stable. And the consequence of this is that some safe drugs are blocked from being marketed, although maybe the patients need these drugs. On the other side, not every proarrhythmic compound is also a HERC blocker. So there are other mechanisms that can lead to proarrhythmia. So if you just screen the HERC, some risks are not detected. So the SIPA initiative uh, has a goal to change focus to address these problems. Um, SIPA stands for Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmic Assessment. And it will also provide a shift from just looking at delayed repolarization to look for proarrhythmogenicity <coughs> in general. So the SIPA goals are to include other ion channels than HERC and to include also in silico models. To include in addition in vitro cardiomyocyte studies and all these approaches combined should lead to a revised, revised uh, guideline S7B. And the final goal is to eventually replace TQT studies. So the data generated by this comprehensive assessment should be so good and so predictive that the goal, final goal would be that you don't have to do the TQT study anymore. But this is, uh, I think, a long way to go. Um, So SIPA takes two complementary approaches to reach this one goal. And uh, the first approach is, of course, patch clamp, automated patch clamp in most cases, on multiple cardiac ion channels. Um, the ion channels that contribute to the cardiac action panel potentials are very well known <coughs> and defined. And uh, if you take from all these ion channels which are known, the most important ones make IC50s and feed these IT50s into an action potential simulation. 
meaning in, in, in silico model, then you can predict the effect of a, of a drug on the human cardiac action potential. On the other hand, today uh, we have uh, new possibilities on, uh, with working on uh, cultivated cardiomyocytes. We now have very good products on the market, human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. And uh, these are beating in culture. And you can measure these uh, action potentials or calcium influx or all the parameters of this beating with various methods. So you have kind of action potential recordings. And CIPA wants to combine this action potential simulation based on patch claim data with action potential recordings and combine this into a prorhythmic score. And this combination will then be called a comprehensive prorhythmia assessment. CIPA. So for CROs, now we will have to implement this. Um, for us, uh, being a rather small CRO, this put us into a very interesting situation. So most of the channels, so of course the HERC, we had implemented for 10 years. The NAV 1.5, we also have implemented as an assay. All the other relevant potassium channels were kind of easy to do. But we had a problem with the calcium channel. Uh, the problem was uh, acquiring acquisition of a, of a good automation-ready cell line. Um, the available cell lines, some we could get our hands on, were not running good on the Q-patch, so were not automation-ready. Um, then there was a limited availability issue. So uh, some of the larger vendors of calcium cell channel cell, cell lines, they just refused to give us the cell line because they said, okay, this is competition. So, and there are also known rundown issues associated with uh, many of the calcium channel cell lines on the market. So this was uh, two years ago. And uh, based on that, a decision was made to use our proven Ijami system, which we usually use uh, in generating cell line to make our own calcium channel cell line. So this Ijami technology is a, a molecular biological strategy to, for stable expression of recombinant cell lines in mammalian cells. And uh, we are doing this with uh, Steinbei Transfer Centrum, a German uh, partner of us in, in Mannheim. And uh, in other projects, we experienced already that this gives us a better long-term stability of expression, more cell clones with a high expression level, and fast and easy stable, stable cell line generation. So now it's, it's known that uh, the calcium channel, if it's expressed on the, on the cell surface, it's toxic for the cell. So the cells are suffering from expressing this ion channel. Um, so we were deciding to use a DOCS-OFF system for inducibility. So there has also been a DOCS-ON system being used for, for this kind of cell line, but we decided to use a DOCS-OFF system because we think it has two advantages. First of all, it's very tight. So it has a very good suppression during cell culture. The cells are really do not express the calcium until they are induced. So that means they are really growing healthy and easy. And uh, no antibiotics is present during the experiment because you take the, toxic, the doxycycline uh, out and as a reaction to this, the current is expressed. So um, calcium channel is a three different subunit entity. So it's not so easy to make. You have to transfect three different subunits. Um, in our case, the expression of the alpha subunit is suppressed during the cell culture. And then just before the measurement, you do the induction by taking the doxycycline out. Here are just some traces illustrating how the current looks like. So it looks like it should be with activation IV. And uh, one possibility to, to uh, validate this uh, calcium channel a little bit is uh, this compound FPL 64176, which is specific to this type of calcium channel. And it's, uh, what it does is it uh, slows down the inactivation kinetics of the, of the calcium channel. So this is uh, the, the purple trace is the normal calcium channel trace. 
And then after putting this uh, activator, you see that the inactivation is not happening actually, and then you get a, get a decent tail current. Um, being ready for automation. So if you work with such a cell line on a Q patch, for example, what you need is a high number of cells that really express the current in the right density. So not too big, not too small. Uh, at least in single hole mode. And uh, after many, many rounds of subcloning, we arrived here. So the gray bar would represent the number of cells that are, have a, a too small current so that we cannot use it. And uh, we can also often we exclude the, this green bar because this is small currents. And the sum of all other green bars are then the number of cells which have a, a decent current. The situation is even better in X mode because if you combine on the Q patch in X mode 10 cells, uh, of course the sum of these cells is always enough current, even if one or two of them is not expressing the current. And, but you can only do this if, uh, if all the cells, current expressing or not, give you a good seal. And we have a fantastic seal rate with the cell line, so we really usually uh, start to use the uh, X mode with the cell line. This is just some pharmacological validation. And what really made me happy, uh, this is one of the first experiments um, when I saw this. This is a control cell. So this cell received the nifidipine, and this is a control cell. And now this one happens to, to have actually absolutely no rundown. And uh, this is not perforated patch. This is not something special. It's just a normal uh, solution set have been recommended by Sofion. So that was really great. Um, of course, if I now say this cell has absolutely no rundown, we need to look at more than just one cell. Yeah. So this is uh, two Q plates, two X mode Q plates. So that gave us 30 successful recordings from 32 wells. And uh, each of these uh, traces here is IT plot of a single cell. And then I calculated the, the thick blue line, the average of these IT plots. And uh, if you really measure it, then you see it is 9% uh, rundown over this time period of a little bit more than 10 minutes. But it's really a very usable cell line with not much rundown. So, um, Anders Lindquist from Sofian was so kind and uh, had a look on this cell line on the cube. So I was curious if it's also working on the cube. And this is uh, recent data from, from our cell line on the cube in Copenhagen. The current distribution is uh, much the same as we see it on the cube patch. And also the distribution of resistances is very nice. So you have to take into account that this is also a multi-hole measurement. Um, so this calcium channel cell line kind of completes our cardiac panel, what we can offer for CEPA studies. And in a typical CEPA study, all of this, uh, either these two, HERC, calcium, and sodium, which forms the so-called CEPA core panel, or the other potassium channels in addition, would be uh, measured on the Q patch, and for each an IC50 will be generated. And then this IC50 would be fed in an in silico model. Uh, and then you end up with a simulated human action potential or with a simulation of the drug effect on the human action potential. There are currently still several models being discussed by the CEPA initiative. So in the end, we have to wait a little bit how this in silico modeling will be standardized. But I'm not going into, into that. So this was the half of my talk. And so far, I talked about half of uh, the SIPA because uh, SIPA will have one half this uh, in silico uh, cardiac currents modulation, and the other half is about integrated human cellular studies. And what does that mean? This is basically cardiomyocytes. Um, human induced. Uh, pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes are now commercially available. They are getting better and better, and you can—they uh, are beating, beating, 
uh, in cell culture. So you have kind of action potentials in 2D cell culture. And now you can measure these uh, action potentials in several ways. Uh, imaging, there are several methods. What we currently uh, are evaluating is calcium imaging. So that would give you a trace of the intracellular calcium. And what I'm going to talk about in more detail, because we are doing this for over 10 years now, is putting these cardiomyocytes on MEAs, multi-electrode arrays. Um, if you put them on MEAs, you get a so-called field potential, field action potential recording. Now, what is this exactly? So you are used to see a cardiac action potential that looks like this in patch clamp. On the MEA, you get something that looks like this. And there's this sharp peak, which looks a little bit like the QRS complex of an ECG. And then you have a flat line doing the plateau phase. And then you have this bump, which looks in many cases a little bit like the P wave in an ECG. And the bump is correlated with the repolarization phase. Actually, uh, biophysically, the field action potential is something like the first derivative of the action potential. In some cases, this does not, uh, this uh, is beautiful in all cases, but in some cases, if you really calculate the first derivative, you end up with a, with a trace like this. So it, then you see the action potential again. Um, you can use this for compound tests. Um, you just put the compound on the mirror and then you wait. You can also do this for a longer period, like days, for example. And then, of course, during data analysis, you have to extract some parameters from these field action potentials. From the sodium component here in the beginning, you can uh, uh, extract the amplitude and the slope. Um, then you can uh, extract the field action potential duration. It's uh, just the time from the sodium component until the peak of this uh, repolarization wave. The beat interval, beat to beat interval, is easily to extract. And then we usually also extract the variability of the beat to beat interval. Um, example drug effects on cardiomyocytes, um, the usual suspects. So, lidocaine, of course, being a known sodium channel blocker, gives uh, the black dots are um, the normalized amplitude of the so sodium peak. So that goes down with concentration. And the open dots is normalized field action potential duration. So with lidocaine, there's no change in that. And with kinidine, of course, which is a sodium channel blocker and a HERP blocker, we would expect to see a change in both parameters, which is also actually the case. So throughout the last years, we have been doing such studies with uh, all the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes on the market. And we actually see that uh, in most cases, all expected effects are visible on these cardiomyocyte studies, but the cardiomyocytes from different vendors differ. And uh, we would not recommend a single one, but we have some experience in uh, the differences that these uh, cardiomyocyte have. They are all good, and we cannot say this one is the best. Hmm. Another thing which can be done uh, during data analysis uh, is uh, the MIA system captures proarrhythmic events. Um, so if you put a proarrhythmic compound like moxifloxacin or E4031 uh, or dofetilite, you really see these proarrhythmic events, and then you can count them. Two minutes. Two minutes. OK, that's good. Um, so this is just a table the usual suspects, uh, um, uh, reference compounds, and uh, with the exception of this uh, little bit tricky HERC activator, this system captures the, usually the effects you, you would expect to see. And I would like to highlight this compound here, isoprotanol, it's a beta agonist, so it would not be captured by any of the ion channels in patch clamp. So a um, little bit about throughput. Um, we have a six-channel 
system where we can do six compounds, uh, and this is doubled. So in the end, it's it's uh, two compounds uh, doing one run, uh, twelve compounds doing one one run, and. Uh, a new system for multi-channel systems is this uh, 96 well system. Uh, it was launched last year. We have it in our lab, and we are just at the moment evaluating it for higher throughput cardiomyocyte studies. So this is the summary, summary uh, slide. Uh, in SIPA, we have this, uh, two, this two, let's say, sides of the story. We have ion channels and in silico models that builds up on 10 years experience of predictivity for herb data. That provides mechanistics insight. So if you see an ion channel block somewhere on one of the ion channels, then you know what's going on. And all relevant ion channels are available for screening. What's ongoing is uh, the standardization of protocols being discussed inside the HTS working group at the CEPA initiative, and also uh, more standard standardization in the H action potential simulation is required. On the other side, you have the chiomyocytes. They have the advantage that you also will see uh, long-term effects, so like uh, expose the cardiomyocytes for, let's say, one or two days. You cannot do that with patch clamps, so that gives ad additional advantages. Then you will also see non-ion channel effects, and the cell lines provided by the uh, cell line providers are, are getting better and better. And also here, there's ongoing stuff so several platforms uh, like op optical readout, uh, MEA readout are being evaluated. So I think this is not finally decided what would, what will, would be uh, recommended. And standardi standardization of protocols and analysis is also on the way. Thank you. <laughs>